Wow, Mary, Mary Jo is on screen. Tell Yochi. Yeah. <laughs> I'll also say hello, Shabtai. Hello, Yochi. Oh, there is Riva. Hello, everyone. Hi, Riva. <laughs> Lovely to see hello. everyone. Hello, hello. What are we in Oklahoma now? Liba Tau was there. Uh, <laughs> you know the expression? <laughs> no. <laughs> We're not in Oklahoma anymore. <laughs> exactly. Ah, so is that a, an existing expression? Okay. Oh, it's so a little good. bit of a variant. <laughs> okay, good. I saw it in a manuscript. <laughs> this suit makes me wonder exactly where I am. Really, but <laughs> okay, so let's start uh, our... Um, I start this uh, session, the last session of uh, our, our conference of uh, celebrating uh, Shabtai's uh, 19th birthday. I should say that I missed the uh, three earlier celebrations for Shabtai. In the first, I probably didn't know about the Khan Institute. Yeah. And in the second and the third, I was uh, abroad for a long period, so I had a good excuse. Uh, this time I did not have any, so I'm here. <laughs> and when I first arrived at the institute, which is not to this is a seminar, which was not much after the celebration, uh, Sabta was I had been here, the chair, the of, uh, of the seminar, and the director of the institute. It was an impressive moderator, keeping well the beginning time, a tiny antidote to the sloppy culture of our place, trying to prevent the discussion from being too heated which was quite more difficult in those days than today, uh, but also adding his own criticism to the very first discussions that were there, and also introducing the speakers in sharp, often ironic precis that captured much about the speakers and the chair. And I don't try to, imi to imitate uh, the latter because it's too difficult. So I was part of the old guards of the institute's I think the, the faculty, while uh, Yudel Kanat took the role of the paternal figure, and Zev Bechler, that of the old uh, Enfant Terrible. And unfortunately, Amos Funkerstein was not really around. Shabtai was respectful, deep, careful, and highly erudite scholar. At least that's the way we saw it as the student. In preparing this event, I learned that Chaptai chaired the seminar also when Yuda was the director, that's in the 80s, and Gabrielle Williams was the secretary of those days, managed to keep some of his introductions in various ways and deliver us a sample. And let me quote one of them, it will be in Hebrew. Uh, so, Chaptai uh, Ungo. ולא מילא את ציפיותיי, הערב עלו להיות אחד המקרים האומללים הללו. את חינוכו הוא רכש במזרחה של אירופה ובצפון מרכזה של ארצות הברית, הוא לימד בשני המקומות גם יחד. היסטוריה, מתמטיקה, היסטוריה של המדעים ועברית. בארץ הוא לימד היסטוריה, מתמטיקה ואזרחות בבית ספר תיכון ולמד עברית באולפן. הוא פרסם מאמרים שונים בשטחי תולדות המתמטיקה והאופטיקה בימי הביניים ובזמן העתיק, גם ספר. יש לו עכשיו במחבש שתפו ספר אחד באופטיקה מדיאבלית ואסטרונומיה בין 1300 ל-1700, מאמר היסטוריוגרפי ארוך שלו למתמטיקה היוונית העתיקה, ידוע במיוחד לשמצה, ועורר עניין רב, המצדיק את סיווגו כסקסק סקנדל. למרות ההצלחה השעורייתית הזו, הוא נעשה ידוע ברבים ושמו הפך לשם דבר רק בזמן האחרון אודות הופעתו הטלוויזיונית המרשימה בתוכנית של אנציקלופדיות בהשתתפותם של שמואל חביבי וישעיהו ליבוביץ' כאשר אפילו עדה בושש נאלצה להודות, ואני מצטט, שהוא לא נעלם כליל בפני שותפיו לתוכנית. I stop here, and I want to go into the details about his talk in that uh, evening. I had a... Uh, the, um, I had only one course that I left with Saptai. Uh, it was intellectual history, the one that I teach today with uh, Leo, this day actually, Leo gave the lecture. And for the final paper, I wrote the subject on the subject that Leo discussed today about Merton School. And Saptai himself did not check the paper, but left the task to his teaching assistant, who will therefore be our first speaker this evening, Vielnitz. 
since he checked my uh, work, Raviel uh, did a few more things. He is a professor of classics and philosophy at Stanford University, working mainly on the history of pre-modern mathematics. His research involves the wider issues of the history of cognitive practices, uh, for example, visual culture, the history of the book, literacy and numeracy. In addition to books and many papers on this and uh, connected uh, issues and on Archimedes, he authored with uh, Maya Arad that, uh, the book called Makom Atam, Sheosek Be Shira Vetarbot Ivrit. So, um, Riviel, uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Do you hear me well, everyone? Am I there? That's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, I really am so grateful for um, uh, being here today. And thank you, Shabtai. And um, uh, it, this is very, very moving for me, as you can imagine. It's um, a, um, a, 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 a great evening um, uh, for all of us. So, um, I, 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 I want to explain, this really um, uh, brings me back and I want to take all of us uh, back just for a brief second as uh, I will get to the mysterious Greek diagram. So uh, this is uh, 1986. And um, uh, I, this is the bulletin, the um, uh, Tel Aviv University bulletin from 1986. And this is the class that changed my life. Toldota Mathematica, Elementim Shel Euclid. You can see Gabriela and Shapta probably spelling the Euclid here. And um, uh, um, uh, we met at eight o'clock in the morning, which is the same time here right now in uh, California and uh, delved into a reading of Euclid's elements, the best class I've ever been to, the most important class I've ever been to, the deepest class I've ever been to, the deepest seminar I've ever been to, the deepest opportunity to really understand by reading, by talking, by discussing, by finding out what is really there not taking for granted what's there, looking at the text and always looking at it for the first time. So this was such a meaningful moment for me. And it was then that I read, so this is actually the first uh, paper by Shabtai that I read. It was in Zmanim, uh, the Tel Aviv University publication, and he published a, a piece on a, um, a historiography of mathematics. And he explained this about Greek mathematics. It came out in the same uh, while I was a student there. Um, explaining, so I won't read it out loud, and uh, no, not all of us here read the Hebrew, but the point was that there is something different about the Euclidean expression, because the diagram is part of how you express this. And there is, the gr Greek language is richer. It's ambiguous, it's full of meaning, it's mysterious, because the letters in the proofs, these are not symbols. These are nouns, they're richer, they do different things from algebraical symbols. To me, this was a revelation. To me, this was a moment when I felt I must understand this. I must follow this up and understand what is this mode of expression? What is this diagram? What do those diagrams do? So ever since then, I've been chasing the mysterious Greek diagram and this is a report from this chase inspired by Sabta's words 35 years back. So here we are. There are several things that are mysterious about the Greek diagram. It's actually part of the mathematics. So it's not an illustration, you use it for the mathematics. It's strange. There are features about it that makes it strange as a piece of, uh, as a picture. And it is something of an anomaly within Greek culture. So I'll speak, um, uh, I, I, I wrote a lot, especially on the first one. I want to say a bit more about the others and especially about the anomaly within Greek culture. I want to make this clear. Ancient Greek culture, and this will be important for us today. This is a culture of speech a culture of performance, a culture of using words in speech, in person, face to face. This is what it's about, everything is about. But then on the other hand, ancient Greek mathematics is completely a visual practice. It's all embedded in a papyrus, in a piece of papyrus. So there is a certain gap. There is a way in which Greek mathematics seems not 
to belong. So this is something we need to understand. How does Greek mathematics belong? So of course, uh, we, we, uh, uh, as was noted, uh, Shabtai um, uh, uh, wants us to make sure that we stay on time. So I'll, I will be brief. I, I will have to rush through this, but uh, several things that I want to do today. I want to state briefly that Greek mathematical diagrams were non-pictorial. So that's the strange thing about them. I want to say a few words about why they were non-pictorial in my view. And this will lead me to a final statement, which maybe explains something about a manner in which we can think about how Greek mathematics did belong culturally. So here we go. So here are um, uh, here is a Greek uh, mathematical diagram. Archimedes, sphere and cylinder, book one, proposition 16. And we have two pictures side by side. The ancient diagram, as I think it can be reconstructed from the manuscripts, and Heiberg's modern diagram, which is the rendition made by the modern editor. What we see here is a cone seen sideways, very typical. We're looking at a three-dimensional object, but we're seeing a flat picture of it. So the triangle is actually a cone. And then there are three pieces of the surface represented quantitatively. This is the uh, theta kappa lambda, those three circles, they are ways of representing in a quantitative way the values, the measurements of certain surfaces. Look what Heiberg did. Heiberg told us the relation, the quantitative relationship of the measurements between the three circles. He did his job. He tells us lambda is greater than theta, theta is greater than kappa. The ancient diagram does not provide this kind of information. It, it avoids, in general, this kind of information. It does not provide metrical information. It's trying to make sure that it does not provide false information in the dimension that really matters, the dimension of configuration. Because what is Heiberg telling us? Heiberg is telling us that there are three concentric circles. He tells us that there is a certain configurational relationship, but there isn't, there isn't. The three circles are not in touch. They don't do anything spatially. They're not in space, so to speak. These are measurements. These are quantitative objects. So the ancient diagrams is quite clear about this. No configuration here. Don't look here for configuration. I'm giving you the correct configuration. I'm not trying to give you the correct metrical information because this is a dimension of information that the, the diagram does not try to provide. It does not provide a metrical picture of the object. So here is another example, which I find very striking. Here from the same sphere and cylinder, we have actually, once again, this is a complicated uh, three-dimensional object, but what we're looking at at this uh, level, at the planner uh, section is a circle and we have have two polygons, one inscribed, one circumscribed. These are polygons, a dodecagon. However, to represent the polygon, what we're using are arcs, arcs of circles. They, um, uh, each side of the polygon is represented by an arc of a circle, and it doesn't matter because the configurational properties are correct. Each um, a, um, a, 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 a side of the polygon either touches at one point or for the circumscribed or touches at two points for the inscribed, and we get the correct relation of configuration there. We get the topology right, so to speak. It doesn't matter that it is so blatantly pictorially wrong. Here is another example from Archimedes method. What we see is a square. This is actually the base of a cylinder and um, a, a, a prism. But but uh, once again, it's a, a section of a three-dimensional object. So we're seeing here a square in this section. In the square, there is a circle. And inside the circle, there is a parabola. These, the thing here that looks like a triangle, eta, theta, epsilon, this thing is a parabola. But we don't care about making a parabola look curved. And of course, the, the reasoning is obvious. It's very hard to do the correct resolution on a polygon and the circle, especially with 12 sides. It's hard to do the resolution on a parabola and the circle, and we don't care. So for the sake of better resolution, we're allowed to represent a straight line as curved, a curved line as straight. Those pictorial properties don't matter. We're providing a schematic 
non-pictorial representation of the main configurational properties, if you will, something like the topology of the situation. It's a kind of a schema of the topology. The ancient diagram is non-pictorial. So it's different from many, many modern diagrams. It's schematic, and yet for this very reason, this I'm not going to explain. This is something that people have written about that I wrote about. This is an idea that goes back to Poincaré. The very fact that it's merely topological, so to speak, means that it's good for the logic. You can rely on it. It's logically reliable schematic and yet serving a logical function. The modern diagram very often is pictorial and for this reason it's fundamentally ornamental or pedagogic. It's not part of the logic in quite the same way. So that's a contrast. Now, why were Greek mathematical diagrams non-pictorial? I'll speak a bit more about this. So there is literature on this, as I mentioned, there is growing literature on the logic of diagrams. Visual long, uh, logic is a field that has been growing over the last 20 years or so. And to the extent that people have thought about this question, the answer implied was, let's think about contemporary um, uh, scholarship on visual logic. You can use diagrams if they're non-pictorial as logical tools, as logical arguments for logical inferences. So in this case, the story then becomes Pictorial diagrams are deductively unreliable. Greek diagrams are deductively used. Hence, Greek diagrams had to be non-pictorial. I think that's the outline of the kind of explanation that we usually provide for this question today. And I think uh, th this is unsatisfactory. This is methodologically wrong, I think, because really they didn't have to rely deductively on diagrams. It's a choice they made. Why did they make this choice? Why did they make this choice to use those diagrams? Why, they were, why did they have this option of using diagrams for deduction to begin with? There are two problems with the account above. For one thing, had Greek mathematicians come to the conclusion that in order to rely deductively on diagrams, those diagrams had to be schematic, well, this actually is a sophisticated, complicated argument. You don't, don't just stumble upon this. We need some kind of analysis going on. There's no indication that anyone in antiquity engages with this kind of philosophical analysis. And we know a fair bit of about ancient philosophy of mathematics. That's a field that survives well, I, I really doubt that there was any discussion of that in antiquity. And even if there was such an analysis, what would happen then? This is something that we debate, and we're talking about ancient Greeks at the end of the day. Of course, had it been a subject of philosophical analysis, it would have been a subject for philosophical debate. It would not have been shared. The very fact that it's shared as a given, as an unproblematic given, powerfully suggest to me that it was not subject to philosophical analysis, that the use of the diagrams was not something that was up to philosophical analysis or up to philosophical debate. I think the best way to account for shared practices is not in terms of the shared philosophy, because Greek, different Greeks do not share the same philosophy, but in terms of a shared material practice. So I want to talk about the shared material practice underlying Greek mathematical writing. So this brings us to the ancient papyrus. Now I'm going to talk briefly about the ancient papyrus in practice. So what was the ancient papyrus like? Were literary papyri all alike? I think to some extent, when we're thinking about literary papyri, ancient papyri, when we're looking at them, th there's a kind of an optical illusion. They look like interesting objects because they survive in interesting fragmentary ways. And this actually is very misleading for the way they were. The Greek mathematical papyrus is the most boring form of writing ever produced. It, I, I mean this, it's, writing is visual. And usually in different cultures, there are ways of making the visuality of the writing speak making the visuality of, visuality of the writing interesting. The Greek mathematical papyrus tries to be uninteresting. It's all the same characters, all the same font, so to speak. It's all uppercase. A lowercase, so to speak, is invented in the Middle Ages. It's all uppercase. It's all the same size. 
it's all the same color. You don't do any effects. In the Middle Ages, in the Arabic in particular, you always have uh, uh, several colors. You always use um, uh, different sizes of um, uh, characters. No, it's all the same size, all the same font, no punctuation. What is extremely strange for a modern reader, from a modern point of view, once again, because it's fragmentary and damaged, perhaps it's not immediately obvious for you looking at this, but there are no gaps between letters, no gaps between words. It's just a stream of one letter after the other. It's an XML. It's really just a pile of information drawn in really the absolutely minimal way of writing this. It's the minimal way of producing the information of what is the phonology you need to produce. Because ultimately, it's, it, it is about the phonology that you produce. I mean, now the question is, what is Greek writing for? The actual bulk, the great bulk of papyri, literary papyri in circulation, they are poetry, epic, lyric. They are this particular kind of poetry, which is comedy, or uh, this particular kind of poetry, which is tragedy. When it's prose, there is a very significant survival, a really large fraction of the literary papyri that survive are Socratic discourses, of course, above all Platonic uh, Socratic uh, discourses. These were really um, uh, frequent um, uh, in the literary survival. And of course, speech. Speech is absolutely central. So what we see is that the Greek literary papyri uses very little visual embellishment. It is really an XML just providing the bare bones of the phonology. But then what you do it for is for some kind of an imagined performance. You imagine in your head, you're reading silently. People used to think in the past that maybe people in antiquity did not read silently, they read silently, but they imagined vocally. You read silently and you imagine not just vocally, you imagine performatively, you imagine the full bodied performance of poetry, comedy, tragedy, um, uh, dialogue, speech, that's what you're doing here. It's minimally interpreted, maximally repetitive. You're not trying to interpret the text in the writing itself, because interpretation is what readers do. Readers, the skill of the reader, what it means to be a Greek reader is to be the kind of person who can declaim. This is what you do education for. You don't do education in order to be able just to get information passively from a text. You do education in order to be able to express, maybe out loud, maybe just in your imagination, the full totality of an embodied performance. This is what you do as a reader. And so the text is just a tool for that. It's a tool for projecting full performances. This is what um, a Greek textuality does. This is Greek scribal practice. So this is the habit of scribes. If you're a scribe, to begin with, if you're a scribe, let's be clear about this, you don't do mathematics as your daily work, right? There is so little mathematics being copied. This should be absolutely clear. Anyone who copies text, including Greek mathematical text, they cut their teeth day in, day out on copying Homer, on copying Plato, on copying Demosthenes. So this is your habit. Your habit is to produce those minimally interpreted, maximally repetitive writing, always just the same delta after the same delta, the same alpha after the same alpha, the same lambda after the same lambda. You don't try to interpret this. You don't try to vary this. You do this in the most boring way possible. That's what you do. This is what you need to do as a scribe. And you need to be a very good scribe to do that, by the way. And they were good at this. They really were able to produce things in a very repetitive, very um, a homogeneous sort of way. Homogeneity is something that they value and that they're good at. And it's hard to achieve. We should uh, respect this achievement. And then there's the habit of readers. They learn to use even a minimally interpreted writing, writing that contains nothing, that provides you with the bare bones, the absolute minimum of information, and you use it to project a make-believe performance. That's what you learn to do if you're a Greek reader. And once again, if you're a Greek reader, this is what you cut your teeth on. This is how you learn to approach a piece of papyrus. You learn it through Homer, not through Euclid. This is what you learn to do. 
So what are those non-pictorial datums? They are produced by ancient scribes who are trying to produce minimally interpreted, maximally repetitive writing. So you don't say, oh, this triangle is like this, this triangle is like that. No, you just do the same triangle all the time. It's always the same triangle. It's always the same isosceles um, um, uh, uh, base at the bottom triangle that you're using again, 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 basically the same size, always using the same alpha, the same triangle, the same delta, the same triangle. It's the same thing, basically. It's the same kind of practice. And it's used by readers who are habituated to use such minimally interpreted writing so as to project a make-believe object. You project a make-believe performance of Homer, make-believe performance of Euripides, a make-believe performance of Menander, you, a make-believe performance of Euclid. So the, the story is not philosophical. I say that in my account, what people think philosophically about diagrams is irrelevant, but an interesting suggestion then that the way in which you use the text to project a make-believe Socrates is related perhaps to the way in which you use the diagram to project a make-believe uh, solid. So the mathematical, so now we're going getting to the mathematical object, this mysterious mathematical object. It's neither identical to nor depicted by the diagram, rather it is made by the diagram, the diagram is what makes it projectable to the imagination. This is what um, um, uh, the mathematical object is. And this is uh, the mysterious Greek diagram. As I said, I've been chasing it for 35 years and the seminar is still in session. This is an interim report. We're still reading Euclid and uh, we will continue to read Euclid. And thank you so much, Shabtai, for starting me on this and happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you very much, Riviel. Uh, Thank you. Uh, very short. Uh, we, I suggest we'll move to Michael and then we'll have uh, some questions uh, together. And then I think that will be, uh, ex except if there is some um, question that seems to be uh, just more uh, urgent in any kind of way. Okay. So uh, let me uh, introduce uh, Michael Fried, is a professor at the Program for Science and Technology Education at Ben Gurion University. His field of research is mathematical education, where his main interest lies in what has been termed humanistic mat mathematics, treating mathematics learning and teaching as genuine human activities and treating the subject of mathematics as its self-human activity. Of course, for us, is more important is, is work as the story of mathematics is more important and among others with uh, Shabtai and their uh, works on Apollonius. Uh, so uh, Michael, please. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Shaul. Uh, I see you read my, my CV, which was written for the people in education at uh, Ben Gurion. Yeah. <laughs> it's not exactly where my heart lies necessarily. But um, anyway, thank you for the introduction. By the way, it's very nice to see Reviel, uh, Reviel here because it reminds me of, the, of when I met Reviel. Um, it was sitting with Shabtai in his office with I think two other people maybe studying, studying Apollonius of Perga. And uh, so that was my introduction, introduction to Reviel as well as to some extent to the Shabtai. So let me put on my share screen. Okay. Yes, share. I was, yes. Do you see it? Good. Yes. Um, so first of all, I, you know, I don't know how Shabtai feels about all this fuss made about him on his 90th birthday. I, I can guess because I know Shabtai pretty well. But um, I have to say, it gives me great pleasure to be here and to see him even virtually, and Yochi as well, who's accompanied, accompanied him through thick and thin. Um, so it's really, for me anyway, a great, a great pleasure. Um, my talk is called uh, Edmund Halley and Shabta Unguru Historians. Um, and it'll have two parts. Yeah. So the first part uh, is Edmund Halley as historian, ruined cities and lost mathematical texts. And the second part, Shabtai Unguru as historian, faithfulness to mathematical texts 
as respect for the past. Um, the first part will be a bit longer than the second part. So if I'm still going and it looks like I've gone past the halfway point, don't worry. Um, the, these these uh, themes are actually related, I think. Um, but first of all, they're related because anyone who studied the Shabtai thinks about historians, thinks about the nature of history and the nature of, of, of people who do history. So it's very natural for me to think about Halley as a historian, what his historical practice in some sense or his attitude was uh, because of Shabtai. So that's immediately the connection. But I think there's another connection too, which I hope to make uh, clear. So let's just start with Halley first. Okay, so uh, here's Edmund Halley. Uh, he was born in, in uh, 16, 1656. He died in, in 1741. Uh, most people know him just because of the comet that's named after him. Uh, well, he did other things besides thinking about comets. Um, well, although he probably did think of himself primarily as an astronomer. And this we see on his, uh, on his tombstone. Uh, this was written actually by his daughters on the tombstone. And the first thing that's said, it's a little bit hard to, it's a little bit hard to read here. Um, the first thing that's said is easily is the prince of astronomers of his age. But they go on to say, uh, in order to know truly how great this man was, read his many-sided writings in which he illustrated, enhanced, and enlarged almost every art and science. So we can do that um, by just looking at um, by just looking at a, um, a volume of the, of the transactions of the Royal Society. I chose 19 for a reason you'll see in a minute, uh, which covers the year 1695 to seven. And these are articles by Halley in that volume that goes on to another page. Some of them um, are what you might expect. There are articles about the sun, there's an article about the eclipses, and then there are um, purely mathematical articles. For example, the second one listed here, a most compendious and facile method for constructing the logarithms. And it's interesting to look into those articles because you see what, a, what mastery uh, Halley had of modern mathematical methods of his time. Of in, this article has uh, infinite series, it deals with the Newton binomial, and uh, really you see a master of modern mathematical methods. There are other articles here which are, are somewhat different uh, from what you might expect. For example, there's an article here, some account of the ancient state, the city of Palmyra, with short remarks of the inscriptions about them. There's other, um, there's other more interesting ones, such as part of a letter from Mr. Halley at Chester, giving an account of an animal resembling a whelp voided per annum by a gray greyhound, and of a Roman altar found there. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about the animal resembling a whelp. Um, Halley himself in this letter says it's an uncouth story, that's his words. But the Roman altar is quite interesting because in the same place there was a Roman altar. Halley discusses the inscription on it, um, comparing it to various two texts and, and, uh, and his historical knowledge. Um, he dates it from between Diocletian and Theodosius, and there's a picture of a man on the, on the altar with a strange cap, and Halley's, Halley's interest in this letter is what that cap is, where, what its origin is. He then goes on to talk about almost sort of archaeological uh, aspects of this altar, the material it's made of, and the material of the surroundings. It's interesting because you really see, one, how interested um, Halley was in these sorts of things, and also how learned he was in, in historical matters. Now, in the other article about Palmyra, um, one has a much more substantial uh, article. Uh, I should say that in this volume, there are three articles about Palmyra. One is an account um, one is an account by two, uh, by two people who visited from the Levant Company, uh, Palmyra, and gave a report. And then there is a, another uh, article by, by um, a man named William Halifax, who recorded the inscriptions. And Halley's article actually responds to these other, these other articles. Now, the first part 
is pretty impressive. It's a, it's, a, it's a very nice history of the city of Palmyra, including the story of the famous Queen Zenobia. Um, it's not quite as thorough as Gibbon. We're, in the first volume of Gibbon's Decline and Fall, there's a long discussion of, of Palmyra, but still it's, it's quite an impressive uh, discussion. Afterwards comes the interpretation of the inscriptions, and there you really see um, how, uh, how learned uh, Halley was philologically, including Hebrew, by the way, because at one point he asks about the name Palmyra, and he says that maybe it come, maybe, or some people may have suggested that it came from Palma, but of course that's not the case because in Hebrew it's Tadmor and, uh, and not Tamar. And he writes this, by the way, in Hebrew, in Hebrew letters in the article. Now, the last part of the section on inscriptions deals with some cities that are near Palmyra, among them Aleppo. And this is a very interesting, this leads into an interesting discussion um, about the, the actual position of some of these cities. Um, Halley is very interested in this because Al-Batani, whom he seemed to have been very impressed by, he seemed to like Al-Batani very much, um, made observations nearby in Raqqa of uh, both of eclipses and of the latitude of, of, um, of Aleppo. He did this by observing the solstices. It's easier to figure out your latitude by taking the winter and summer solstice and dividing the difference. Um, and Halley is looking at these numbers and Ptolemy's numbers, um, and he finds discrepancies. And he asks whether maybe, whether perhaps the axis of the earth has changed. And this is connected to a theory he has about the moon, about the acceleration of the moon. And he asks at the end of this, this, uh, of this article, he says that I hope that some people will go back there and make some precise measurements. The point of this, the point of saying that is that one, this, ar this article is very historical. It looks at sources. On the other hand, it uses this historical uh, situation as a way of speaking about modern uh, scientific matters. Now, it, the interesting thing is it goes the other way as well. So an earlier paper um, concerns the time and place that Julius Caesar made his first descent upon Britain. This was written some year, a few years earlier and um, here, what Halley does is that he looks very closely at Julius Caesar's, um, Julius Caesar's account, a little bit also Dio Cassius, but mostly Julius Caesar's account, partly because Halley says it's closer to the event. And uh, Caesar makes remarks about the moon. So Halley knows about eclipses of the moon and about the, about the tables of the progress of the moon. And he comes to the conclusion by this bringing his modern scientific knowledge, he comes to the conclusion that, um, that Caesar took his first step in Britain on August 26th, uh, 55 BC, BCE. It's very well argued in this paper. Now, in this case, Halley um, begins the paper by justifying such papers in the transactions. Now, as we saw in the, the volume 19, um, there were papers like this, but Halley was concerned about justifying historical papers in the transactions. This may have been because he was partly responsible for the transactions. Uh, there was no editor of the transactions, of course. Uh, most of the people who took care of it were the officials in the Royal Society, and Halley at this point was the clerk of the Royal Society. In any case, what he says is that uh, though chronological and historical matters may not seem properly the subject of these tracts, yet there was some discussions recently in the Royal Society, and they thought it fit to command it to be inserted in the philosophical transactions. I wish I had an article commanded to be published. In any case, as an instance of the great use of astronomical computation for fixing and ascertaining the times of memorial actions when omitted or not duly delivered by the historian. So what we see here is science in the service of history. Halley is saying that I can use modern science to interpret historical, uh, historical events and historical matters. Um, there's a very nice article, uh, really, I learned a lot from this article by Alan Chapman, which discusses exactly this issue of Halley's use of historical evidence. 
And Chapman concludes that this is really an essential thing about how Halley thought altogether. Um, and he says, he ends his article by saying, Halley demonstrated that whether one looks at ancient geography, biblical narratives, monsoons, or nebulae, the scholar must be scientific and the scientist must also be historian. And Chapman brings a lot of other examples besides the ones that I've mentioned here. Now he mentions, Chapman mentions in this article, um, Halley's work in uh, mathematics, in his, his historical work in mathematics, but it only gets about two or three lines. Um, and so I want to say a little bit more about that because I think that uh, there are some ways in which his work with mathematical, historical mathematical texts is related to these earlier, these other um, uh, historical works, and in some ways, in significant ways, very different. So let's look at that. Now, um, Halley really takes off looking at historical mathematical texts when he's made the civilian professor of geometry at Oxford in 1703. This was after John Wallace uh, had died. And well, I should probably mention also that, that do, you, do you remember the, the animal resembling a well? Um, that, was re that was actually reported by Dr. Wallace, who I assume was John Wallace. Uh, but anyway, I, I'll get away from that uncouth story and get back to mathematical texts. Um, when Halley began as the civilian professor, he had to teach Euclid and Archimedes Apollonius. Uh, Henry Seville, who created the professorship, uh, required uh, people to teach the ancients. But Halley really uh, uh, took hold of this with great zeal. And already in 1706, he produced a translation of Apollonius's cutting off of a ratio and a reconstruction of cutting off an area. The translation is from Arabic. And I'll say a, a, a word about that in a few minutes. Um, he also produced an edition of the conics, of Apollonius's conics, uh, both the Greek, uh, the Greek uh, edition from uh, books one to four and the translations from the Arabic of books five to seven. He also reconstructed book eight, which was lost in antiquity. When he does these reconstructions, it, th there's something reminiscent by, about the way, the archeological way that he treated other uh, issues. He looks at texts, he compares what was here. He tries to put together, it's, one sees him almost building these texts the way he might reconstruct the city of Palmyra. Um, and in the case of the cutting off of a ratio and, and uh, cutting off of an area, it, it sort of makes sense. These, these subjects are related. Let me just say a word about what those books are about because it's a kind of an unusual subject the conics people know what that is, but cutting off a ratio, I ought to explain what the problem was. Uh, it, you have two lines, AB and DE, and you have a point on each of them, G and Z here. And then you have a point, uh, another point, H, and you have to find a line through H that cuts A, B, and D at points K and L, so that these segments, GK and ZL, that they have a given ratio, say two to one or three to one or three to two. That's cutting off a ratio. In cutting off an area, it's exactly the same setup, except that the, the two lines have to contain a rectangle um, uh, which has a given area. So to start, these books are already very closely uh, related. But Halley also looks at other texts, in particular Pappus, who describes the content of these two works. And Pappus really describes them as if they're parallel. Pappus uh, says what the books are about, and then he says that cutting off a ratio, this many dispositions, this many cases, and then cutting off an area is this many dispositions and this many cases. And you can really see that these books were parallel. So Halley goes and he works from his translation of cutting off a ratio and builds cutting off an area in the same way. So in this way, he sort of feels like he's like an archeologist. Um, when he does the conics, uh, he doesn't have as firm a scaffold as he did with cutting off an area, but still he has a remark by Apollonius in book seven of the conics. 
a, in which Apollonia says that the theorems in book seven were the basis of the, uh, of the problems in book eight, the book that was lost. And so Halley again goes, and he goes through book, uh, book seven and very carefully uh, goes through the theorems of book seven and then creates a problem that's related to the sets of theorems in book, in book seven. Very systematic, very scientific. But here's where the difference comes in. When Halley does his reconstruction of book eight, which I know much better than the other, than the uh, um, uh, cutting off of an area, after he presents the problem that uh, in the voice of Apollonius, and he does this really in the voice of Apollonius, he, he writes, his Latin sometimes imitates the Greek. It sometimes, it was, it's awkward sometimes, but it's awkward only because it's really imitating the Greek. Um, he's really trying to speak in the voice of Apollonius. Well, after he presents the, the problem and solves the problem, very often, in fact, in a third, of the, a third of the propositions, he will make an addition. And the addition is in his own voice. And we know it's in his own voice because he often addresses Apollonius. He often addresses him by name. Now, these additions are very interesting. Uh, they bring in subtly modern ideas, because what Halley generally does, I, I think in every case, is that where Apollonius would speak about the position and the magnitude of some lines, say the conjugate diameters of some conic section, uh, Halley will say that, well, let's just consider the magnitude. Now, why is that an import of modern ideas? Because that's an algebraic way of thinking. That's how Descartes begins the geometrie that we can, just by the knowledge of magnitudes, we can solve geometrical problems. Now he introduces these additions with, with modifiers such as most expedient in not at all in, in, in elegant fashion. And then he goes on and presents his, his addition. I've thought a lot about these, these um, expressions and wondered about their tone. Um, what, how is he saying this as he's writing this? It was very clear to me that um, they're not boastful. Uh, he's not trying to show up uh, Apollonius. Um, in fact, the additions are very modest. As I mentioned before in the paper about logarithms, he, uh, Halley is a very, very good mathematician um, and he can do very sophisticated things. These are not terribly sophisticated. So I think that what he's really doing, he's engaging Apollonius. It's almost as if they're in dialogue, as if he's saying, here is your solution and it's a beautiful solution, but you know, you could do even a very elegant thing if you just look at the magnitudes. He's not trying to say that what Apollonius is doing wasn't as good. He's just adding something. There are truly additions. So the tone is really a kind of dialogue with a much respected interlocutor. And I think that, that that tone really embodies his relationship to these historical texts. It's a tone, it's a relationship of dialogue. And here you really have to understand that Halley is unabashedly modern. Um, and yet he has a tremendous respect, a genuine respect for the past. Here's the opening of the preface of of the cutting off of a ratio and the reconstruction of cutting off an area. Now he, he elaborates things in this preface that he doesn't in the preface to book eight. So it's very interesting, this preface. He begins it by saying, however much the learned men of our and previous generations have rendered service to mathematical knowledge, who discovered develop and developed the algebra of species, the, arith the arithmetic of infinities, and more recently the doctrine of fluxions, so Vieta and Wallace and Newton, none of this should detract from the glory of the ancients who brought geometry to such perfection, which could perhaps have made posterity wonder without the investigation of their writings, how it were possible to catch up with them. What outstanding and consummate geometers they were so gifted with subtlety and inventiveness. This is a person who does not see the present necessarily as the as the perfection of the past. The past is worth looking back at for its own 
for its own sake. And what we see a little bit later in this preface when he describes how he actually translated um, the text, he used um, Bernard. Bernard was the civilian professor of, of astronomy who had passed away and had begun a translation of Apollonius. He used Bernard's translations, as he says, as a kind of key where he would compare Bernard's translation and the Arabic. And this is how he learned Arabic. But in the course of this description, he says it's a key to what? A key to opening the investigation of the mind of Apollonius. He wants to engage the mind of Apollonius. So without losing his own identity as a modern, Halley wanted to get to know the mind of Apollonius. He wanted his, his way of doing this was in the act of reconstruction and translation listening closely to Apollonius by speaking in Apollonius's own voice and speaking to Apollonius, but not imposing on him the power of his modern tools, which he very well knew were very powerful. I think in this way, he's very different from figures like Fermat before him who reconstructed Apollonius's plain loci, or even someone like Michel Chal after him in the 19th century who reconstructed Euclid's porisms. Both Fermat and Schall, more Fermat, saw their reconstruction efforts to a great extent as opportunities to show the power of their own modern methods, sort of mathematical conquerors, as I said in another talk once. Okay, so this brings me to Shabtai Unguru as historian, faithfulness to mathematical text as respect for the past. So let's go from Halley to Shabtai. Halley was in effect one sort of historian when he thought about Palmyra and when he thought about Apollonius. He couldn't maintain the same kind of distance from Apollonius of Perga that he could from Palmyra. When he worked on mathematical texts, he was ever a mathematician in dialogue with other mathematicians. In this way, his attitude could not be compared to a true historian of mathematics like Shabtai who famously said the history of mathematics is history, not mathematics. Now, this statement, history of mathematics is history and not mathematics, um, you know, has been misunderstood by Shabtai's detractors, or, uh, and he still, uh, unfortunately, still does have detractors. Um, for example, recently there was a paper in which um, authentic history in Shabtai's view and in mine as the author says, as Shabtai's discipline, I have no argument with that, is exemplified in a thought experiment in which the study of frequency of Greek roots and Greek mathematical texts is investigated. This, the author contains, would satisfy the criteria of authentic history. Why? Seeing that no modern mathematics is used at all in such a study. Well, needless to say, uh, this misses the point, I think, of what Shabtai was trying to talk about. Um, I think we have to go on in that paper just a few, few lines later, um, the words that Shabtai uses. And I think there's great significance in his choice of words uh, in that this is this paper in Isis, um, the, the paper about the state of the art. I think these words are the key of what he wanted to say. These were words like faithful, sympathetic, responsive, and sensitive. So on the same page as the history, not mathematics quotation, we read, entrenched as it is, the traditional interpretation of the history of ancient mathematics must give way to a new, more sympathetic and historically responsive interpretation, simply because the old interpretation has outlived its usefulness and is now an obstacle on the road to a sensitive historical understanding of ancient mathematical texts. These words tell us that Shabtai's uncompromising refusal to use any modern symbolism or modern mathematical frameworks in interpreting the past is actually an expression of his own deep respect for the thinkers of the past who deserve a sympathetic, responsive, and sensitive hearing. In this, I think there is a certain connection uh, between Halley's reading of ancient writers and Shabtai's. Shabtai, like Halley, wants to hear the voice of the ancient mathematicians. It is not a matter of removing mathematics, but of letting the mathematical thought of the ancient thinkers be heard, as Halley had said about uh, Apollonius. To impose on them one's own mathematical conceptions is putting words in their mouth, 
and distorting their own words. In any case, it's no longer a matter of listening to them, but listening to oneself and bathing perhaps in the clarity and power of one's own conceptions. Chapte's historical attitude was one like Halley's of deep respect for these mathematic mathematicians of the past. And this means that they could speak for themselves. One has to trust that they spoke in a way that could be understood and it's incumbent on true listeners of, the, of these historical texts to pay attention. Now, the quality of being a good and demanding listener are also the qualities of a good human being. And this perhaps is the greatest lesson I have learned from Shabtai's example, that there is a smooth transition to and from one's integrity as an academic and one's integrity and in honesty as a human being. Whenever I speak to Shabtai about my daughters, about the kibbutz, about anything else in my life, I find that he is just as demanding and just as insistent that I be clear and that he understand what I'm saying. In this case, I should also mention his fantastic memory, despite his numerous dis disclaimers, and it's still fantastic. I know when I say something, he's going to remember it, even months later. And this, I believe, goes pari passu with his determination to listen and understand another. For these qualities, I place priceless value on Shabtai as a scholar, a teacher, and most of all, as a friend. And that's it. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael, for, my, for this uh, very interesting uh, thoughts and ideas on Shabtai and very nice words for him. So um, I would like to open the, uh, some discussion uh, probably uh, for the two talks, if uh, people have some ideas before I give uh, Shabtai the floor to respond. And also has, I forgot to say, um, uh, at the opening, but uh, Gidon had already said in the earlier session, if someone wants to add a few words on Shabtai, there will be also time for that before Shabtai will, will speak. But uh, uh, some questions to the talks of uh, Michael and uh, Raviel. David. Yes, uh, very nice to have such uh, two contrasting uh, talks about Greek mathematics. And I'll just ask a, a fairly, um, yeah, general question, but then maybe with a specific idea behind it. So, uh, Michael, you talked about these, uh, these famous lost works, and I guess it's right, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's right that uh, Halley actually learned Arabic in order to translate these, these uh, two works which were only available in, in Arabic. Yeah, I didn't, I, didn't, um, I didn't read the whole thing. Maybe I should try to see if I can find it. Hold on for a second. If I, if I well, that's kind of, it's kind of a side point. Actually, I, here, here's what I was wanting to get at. The, um, the, these works uh, are mentioned famously by Pappas in, in book seven. And uh, I, I'm interested in motivation. So uh, you, you spoke about, you know, this, this strong identification with uh, the mind of Apollonius, etc. Uh, and I, I trust your judgment completely on these things since you spent so much time on it, but, but there was part of a larger interest in that time period in reconstructing these lost works, and they are named as part of an analytic tradition that the Greeks had for solving problems. So there's a methodology there as well. Now, maybe there are lots of different variant uh, variant takes on that and so forth. But um, maybe you could comment on that. Is, is, uh, is Halley actually to be placed in a much larger context of interest in reconstructing ancient works that in particular shed light on this aspect of Greek mathematics? Yeah, um, you know, what I, was, what I really was trying to say about, about Halley was that his reconstructions, well, let's just say this, you can reconstruct works in different ways. And um, there are also modern reconstructions of works. Um, I mean, I didn't mention, for example, um, uh, Ibn al-Hatham's uh, reconstruction of book eight as well. Mm -hmm. 
in, in fact, news. in fact, in in many ways, this whole study of 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 uh, Halley began with a remark by Hohenweig, uh, who who produced a translation of of Ibn al uh translation, in which he says that 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 Halley's Halley's uh, reconstruction is a just a trivial. He's literally, a, a tr I think he's called it a trivial appendix. Uh -huh. He writes it as a trivial appendix to book seven, as opposed mm -hmm. to even Al Haytham's um, uh, reconstruction, which is very, very deep. Well, I started thinking about that comment, and I realized that you can reconstruct things in different ways in different spirits. So when you look at reconstructions like even Al Haytham, when you look at reconstructions like those of Fermat, it's very clear. Shal, I think, is maybe something, maybe even something else. Um, and when you look at Halley, although they're they're interested in works which do which are in this analytic tradition, the books that Pappus mentions in Book Seven of the collection, um, they're really done in a very very different, different spirit. So even Al Hatham, I think, is is really, uh, you know, he's a mathematician who. Who wants to do mathematics? That's why I tried to stress that Halley's additions weren't weren't spectacular. He wasn't trying to do anything spectacular. I think this is a misunderstanding when he says trivial. Um, I don't think he was trying. I think even Alhaitham was trying to uh, not necessarily to do <laughs> Apollonius, but to actually produce something mathematically significant. Fermat, I think, was trying to to uh, bring out this. Um, this analytic tradition by showing how this these works were actually, you know, we're actually what we're trying to do in algebra. Halley, I don't think, is doing that. And um, he sometimes he comes close. For example, there's a scolia in book in book eight, in which he talks about how the Greeks had methods um, for solving the problem of, of finding a, you know, finding a rectangle with a given area and a given perimeter. So, so I think that the whole point, my whole point was that there are different spirits in which you can do these, these reconstructions, even though the work uh, does, as you say, fit into this analytic uh, tradition. I wanted to find this thing that, about the Arabic. Can I read it? Because it's a beautiful little description. Uh, I think there are a few questions, so I think we'll okay. try to give to a discussion. Okay. Uh, Leo? Thank you, Michael and Raviel, for the very nice talk. Uh, and this completes a very long day of uh, interesting talks that, that we all give as a homage to Shabtai, I think, in a very nice way. Many of us being his students uh, in some way, each one in his time. But my question is to Raviel. And now, uh, in your description of the text and uh, how things work with the diagrams and so on. But here, I think, since you, you, you put this uh, stress on the scribe and the habit of the scribe, actually you are talking about the uh, communication of mathematical ideas as it would be today an article, right? Uh, and uh, you could talk about, you spoke about XML, so now we are writing LaTeX and so on. So it imposes certain things in communicating. But what about the creation of the mathematical ideas? Uh, I, I don't think you can give this talk now, but just give us a hint because I think that you yourself have mm -hmm. spoken about these and you know how they they drew the diagrams and so on. So what about what is the place of these diagrams in the creation of mathematical ideas? Yeah, well, it's always something that I um, more or less uh, avoided. So th th that's a problem for me, right? So uh, I I I don't really um uh, uh, so many people feel that they can really uh, sit together with our communities with Apollonius so and they, um uh, do the mathematics with them but I'm no Holly so but I, I I can read texts so I'm trying to work with text and this imposes a certain uh, constraint on what the things you're likely to do I'm more um uh, 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 um, uh, limited to the study of uh, mathematical communication. Uh, it's clear that the um, uh, process of uh, writing involved the um, uh, uh, drawing. And uh, this is something I try to speculate a bit about uh, using the order of letters, etc. And um, 
uh, so you do a drawing and think about it and probably you know it was on a wax tablet. Wax tablet is interesting because it's not that different from a papyrus in phenomenological terms. It is this kind of thing you hold in your hands. So it's a kind of the same space as a papyrus, the same kind of resolution as a papyrus. Maybe you draw a bigger diagram, but you have to contend with the uh, constraints of a wax tablet. So at any rate, we're not talking about uh, um, a drawing in the sand, mm -hmm. which I think is completely impractical. This is uh, a hobby horse I've been riding um, uh, always. So um, uh, th that's as much as uh, you can say there. But yes, um, uh, the thinking is through the diagram. Uh, uh, but most mathematicians did not invent mathematics, right? I think we can agree to that. So the great bulk of mathematicians became mathematicians because they read mathematics. So it, uh, this entire thing about how mathematics is communicated, I mean, it, is an, it has an important educational consequence, right? So what we're looking at is the material reality of how one becomes exposed for the first time to mathematics. So this will inform how you use drawings yourself, I think. So in this way, I think maybe, you know, it's a chicken and egg kind of situation. So um, uh, yeah, this is just uh, mostly me admitting my uh, limits as a story. So yeah, thanks. Menachem? I, I, this this day has been fantastic and an absolutely wonderful tribute to you, Shabtai, as a teacher, uh, who's inspired such a gallery of um, uh, diverse uh, researchers. It's absolutely fantastic, um, Riviel. I, I I was um, I was fascinated by your talk. And I was fascinated by your talk because the papyrus you showed us, that boring, uh, uh, minimalistic text, reminded me of a Sefer Torah. And I think there's, you, you have a great counterpart in not the Jewish tradition, but the Talmudic tradition. Because a text like that, what it doesn't do it 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 had it 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 refrains deliberately from controlling its meaning, and really what 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 it's meant to do, and the same goes for the diagrams, is and this is this this should be I think the answer to Leo's question, is that all creativity is in the reading and not in the writing. Okay, you, you, but it, the, 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 this is a written text which is the basis for reading in, not reading out, so to speak. Now, of course, the way in which uh, the Torah scroll is written is dictated by the rabbis, right? It's not dictated from heaven. It's dictated by the rabbis who keep it to the barest minimum. And it, it looks exactly like that. No ornaments, no, no colors, uh, no, no pictures, of course. And, and then when you look at the oral tradition, which is the tradition of reading, um, it's totally diversified. Now, this isn't something you spoke about, which, which of course, if you have a minimal text, you'll have different readers reading it differently. And that, that's an interesting aspect, which you, know, which you didn't mention in, 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 in your talk, but in so far as writing mathemat mathematics and drawing mathematics in, in the way you describe, okay, is intended for the educational purpose of, of, of enhancing a performative reading. What you have to expect is a diversified uh, um, set of readings rather than a controlled meaning, uh, which will then get passed on. I, I, th this has helped me understand, although I've been working on this for years, the, the, the difference between the written and the oral Torah. You get the same thing, and this, I'll, I'll finish with this, in the, in the Amoraic, in, in the Talmudic interpretations of the Mishnah. And I think Yishai Rosenzweig's book on, on the imagined ritual, on a halachic ritual which is written not in order to be performed, 
okay, but in order to be imagined by its learners is, is exactly the same kind of thing that you're talking about. This is really to open a discussion with you because I think the, 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 there are wonderful analogs and, um, and mutually illuminating um, between, be, 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 between the textuality and readership within, within the world of Talmudic learning and what you've just described about Greek mathemati mathematics. Thank you so very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 I, I absolutely agree. And they are absolutely, oh, we, we, we need this uh, dialogue because people are uh, stuck in their silos. But uh, and what, a question we need to think about is the question of uh, influences and um, the way in which those um, uh, parallels work. Um, uh, uh, my understanding always was that uh, the rise of uh, punctuation in uh, medieval manuscripts is um, uh, closely paralleled by um, a Tiberian interpretation, Tiberian um, uh, uh, um, uh, diacritical texts of um, uh, uh, the Mikra. I, 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 I never uh, figured out how the textual practices of the Mikra was, were formed. Uh, one interpretation would be that this is basically a Greek kind of practice, which is completely possible. Another one is that there is a structurally analogous situation where the emphasis is all about the performative use and the entire um, uh, emphasis is on uh, marking yourself as a good performer of this uh, textual um, uh, object. So where uh, everything is invested in um, uh, learning how to become this uh, master interpreter. Uh, so it's, it, it would be extremely interesting if we find that these practices are parallel. Just, just half a sentence. First of all, the Tiberian description is part of the interpretive. I, I mean, this isn't Torah Shebikhtav, this is Torah Shebaal Peh. Um, and and, and I, I, I bracket the word influence. That makes it uninteresting. I mean, if you've got these two cultures which contrast and compare, um, uh, you know, who, who, who influenced the other is beside the point. I mean, it, it, the contrast would even be more illuminating. Um, Ona? Uh, yes, well, thank you both for your interesting talks. My question is to Reviel, and it's about uh, philosophers and diagrams. So it's true that uh, diagrams is not a major philosophical topic, uh, at least not in the classical period, but Plato and Isaac do refer to diagrams, and uh, so Plato doesn't like the use of diagrams. And Aristotle is worried about uh, whether mathematicians uh, assume false propositions when they draw diagrams. So I'm just curious to know what is your take on these uh, comments? No, uh, uh, what I said was more limited. So yeah, surely, actually, does it mean, um, does it make my claim stronger or weaker? I don't know. Uh, uh, the fact is we do have um, uh, mentions of the diagrams. We see a recognition of the existence of the diagram in um, uh, 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 both Plato and Aristotle. A bit less, actually, in the later commentary tradition. There's less of um, <clears throat> a reflection about this. Maybe um, yeah, um, focus uh, is very important. It's the main well, issue of his the, the second prologue of uh, to his uh, commentary. So right. Uh, uh, what you don't see is anything resembling the um, uh, uh, question, any hint of anything related to the question of the um, uh, uh, structural properties of the diagram, whether they are schematic or pictorial. And uh, uh, basically, they, uh, I, I suppose the um, uh, a simple reading of the mentions, which are really in passing, really in terms of the actual diagrams, they, it would look like the diagrams are discussed as if they were iconic representations of the object. 
So they talk about the square and they have the square and they, um, in front of their eyes. So, um, uh, but they use it as if it was um, a, um, a, um, a, 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 the thing itself. So uh, uh, I simply suggest just because there is actual discussion, as I mentioned, just because the actual philosophy of mathematics does survive, relatively speaking, from antiquity, it's a, uh, philosophy survives well, mathematics survives well, relatively speaking, it's a field that we know. It's interesting and telling, and um, it's not completely useless to note the fact that the kind of questions that people have been debating on the 20th century are not reflected there. So I, I think that's uh, relevant. Um, uh, it's not um, uh, the most important argument one would uh, bring here because it's an argument from silence, but I think it's, it means something. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Um, I would uh, like if to just to make if there are any further questions. And uh, so I would like if anyone wants to have some words, uh, further words on, on, on Shabta, if this is a good time for that. Okay. I would. Yeah, please. Please, Marius. Please. Okay. Go on, go on, Marina. Go on. Yes, go Marinos, on. go on, go on, Marinos. We are waiting for you. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. I I would just uh, uh, like I used to do tell an tell an anecdote about an accident in in uh, in some time in the nineties <coughs> about the what I call the traveling circus of the nineties and. It was in a, 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 a seminar in, um, I, I don't remember if it was in Athens or in Delphi. It makes no difference because the chair, the chair was, was, was taken by David Fowler. And we had a very lively discussion that I don't remember the topic, but I remember that at a certain point, uh, uh, David Fowler cut off all the discussion and then there was silence. Then he then he asked the, the audience, "Do you do you know what it is to do a tithebuck? To do a tithebuck?" And nobody answered it. And he said, "To do a tithebuck that is to put up your finger and to walk slowly all the way to the blackboard, and then." In one single drawing, contradict, contradict everything that we have agreed on. Someday I'll do a tithe park on him. Now, I'm sorry to say that David Fowler didn't live long enough to do a serious tithe park on me, but Sabatai has lived long enough to try to do a tithe park, but I'm sure that he'll not want to do it, I don't even think that he need it. So happy birthday to my friend, Sabatai. Birthday, and anyone else wants to add something? Can I say something? Yes, please. Joe? Hi. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my dear friends, Shabtai and Yoki and Muki, and I see so many other good friends too, Libra and David and Buta and others. Uh, this is, uh, we're, we're so glad, Bob and I, to be <clears throat> part of this, to be able to actually participate. This is one of the few th good things that's come out of the last year. The fact that this conference, from our point of view, turned into a virtual conference and that we could actually see it. And that we could see some of you in a way we haven't been able to see in the old ways when we all got together. And, uh, and had to <clears throat> some toast together and enjoyed each other's companies and talked about Apollonius and Pappus and Euclid and uh, the need to rewrite the history of mathematics. Um, Bob and I were with Shoptai and Yoki and Muki and Yoram 
Iran maybe, I think he's there somewhere, or maybe he's had to go back to work. But, um, and uh, I, I remember so well when Shobtai was doing that early work and how very proud that we were of what he was doing and that he was taking a stand that really took, as you all know, all of you, a lot of courage and made a reputation for himself uh, to be sure. But in the early days, it was a reputation that came in with the cost of a lot of criticism. And uh, we've been proud of him since then. Um, and for all of his work as a scholar, he's and his family are among our dearest friends. And um, I feel a little bit emotional, but thank you for including us. And I would like just to say briefly that Michael Fried's uh, comments on Ushoktai were, I thought, quite wonderful. Uh, because they go to the heart of <clears throat> Shoptai's uh, method of in dealing with other people and engaging in discourse with them. Um, it sounds a lot like uh, interrogation, although Michael <laughs> makes the point, I think very good point, that Shoptai simply wants to understand what you're saying. And he wants you to be clear about what you're saying too. So it's a very interesting pedagogical way of interacting with colleagues and I think probably with students as well, which is why he's had such an enormous influence, I think, over so many people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I saw that Gabriela wants to say something. <laughs> well, I, well, one old timer to another old timer. We've had a lot of common uh, memories and we've got a lot of common pupils and descendants and all I wish is for you and your health and gesundheit and brood and all that for all the years to come. That's all. Thank you very much Gabriela and Ute please. I only want to raise my glass to Shabtai and wish you all the best for the future. Thank you. And thank you. We'll give, let the Shabtai uh, speak first and then we'll have everyone toast uh, one's glass. So uh, Shabtai, please, it's your turn. Ah, sorry, Liva. Uh, you are mute. Thank you. I, David earlier said, you know, about how some mathematicians and probably some historians of mathematics identify as Platonists. And I think that we probably remember that Walter Burkhardt claimed that what we know or think we know about the Pythagoreans was due to Plato and members of his school wanting to create an intellectual heritage for themselves. And Mary Jo, when she spoke, said she was getting a bit emotional. I am as well. To see Shabtai, Mary Jo and Bob, David, Reviel, Arthur Harris, who some of you have not met yet, who's also here, um, my current PhD student who's working on the peripatetic or pseudo Aristotelian mechanics. We are all part of the same intellectual heritage that we have inherited from and with Shabtai. And for me, this is really just a wonderful thing, as Mary Jo said, to be able to come together in a way that we would probably not be able to do physically. So once again, thanks to everyone who's organized this today. Shabtai, Yohi, it's absolutely wonderful to see you. And I hope we all have many more celebrations together. Long life and good health to the two of you. L'chaim. After the floor is yours, but you are muted. We don't hear you because you're on mute. Okay, now now do you, now you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, this is not my birthday, and being a an East European Jew suffused by the local culture and the local superstitions, I should tell you that 
one of those superstitions was that doing something before it's time, like celebrating one's birthday before, is trying to get a, uh, to trying to force God's way. And this is not going to go unpunished. Okay. Uh, my uh, brief intervention is entitled Longevity and Merit. Uh, it is not the original title, which began with the Yiddish expression Moichel Toivis, originating in Hebrew and expressing displeasure at something meant to please one. Gideon, the anima motrix of the celebration, <laughs> took offense with it due to a misunderstanding. You will find my brief remarks to be a collection of truisms. So be it. Before anything else, however, let me express my sincere thanks to Gidon and Shaul, and last but not least, to all my former students honoring me with their virtual presence. All of you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. I also thank the new Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences who uh, opened this gathering. Longevity and merit are independent variables, of course. The French composer Daniel Francois Esprit Aubert remarked that aging seems to be the only available way to live a long life. <laughs> While Ambrose Bierce, the author of the Devil's Dictionary, defined it as the uncommon extension of the fear of death. I, however, prefer, for obvious reasons, the Yiddish sayings, dying while young is a boon in old age. Starming is a tonic when is old. And since I didn't see you even smile, I think you didn't understand me. Dying while young is a boon in old age. And another one, the principal objection to old age is that there is no future in it. I won't read to you the original Yiddish. I am a born pessimist. All hours hurt, but the last one kills. Vulnerant omnes ultima necat. This is an inscription on a solar clock. And uh, I remember that suddenly with my failing memory while talking some weeks ago to Michael Fried. And was Mark Ogias, Ogias, I don't know how you pronounce it, the Catalan poet, who said, and you know, I resonate to this, to his verses, qui no es trist, de mos dictats no cur, o en alcun temps que sea triste stat. Well, the, the, the message is, you know, and I don't pretend to know Catalan, even though I can uh, understand Spanish. Um, only if you are sad, could you understand my writings or should you approach them? All this in spite of the many good things that happened in my long and glorious life the last of which is this event. 
my former students, my friends, my family, mark the happy jalon of my life. I am deeply grateful to all of them. Which brings me to the famous ballad of the Podoloya Rebbe, written in Yiddish by Itzik Manger. Itzik Manger was the greatest poet writing in Yiddish. I know, you know that most of the people, at least those I, that I know very well, don't know Yiddish, and therefore I can't recite it to you, even though it would be very nice. But I can more or less give you uh, a version, prosaic version of its contents. At the end of the day, the rabbi, who was too nearing his end, um, he is walking in nature and he is the rabbi, the rabbi, but the rabbi is not rabbi. And, and uh, uh, this is an important, this is an important uh, difference. Um, is from Podoloi. The Romanian name is Podoliloie. And I was born in that state. On January the 1st, 1931. During an evening walk, as I said, the rabbi is communing with nature, its main components in this case being the moon and the stars. Asked to account for his life, he mentions all the everyday deeds he performed day in, day out to help his fellow man to live a good life. And he refuses when asked to say vidui, vide. That is the prayer one is meant to say before one dies. His refusal stemming from the fact that when you say vidui, it's usually accompanied by tears and pain, this being a sad event, increasing sadness on earth, he expires Therefore, without Vidui, and a voice from heaven, it's not God, it's the full moon, is heard murmuring, I wish all my friends and loved ones would end their days in such a fashion. I, of course, ruined Munger's ballad by my prosaic pedestrian uh, reconstruction. Still, the idea is well meant and should be obvious. I am grateful. I thank you all for being participants in this event. And I apologize for these lucubrations, um, which were not a scholarly critique of the contributions I heard. Uh, I'm getting old and, and uh, uh, nearing uh, Alzheimer's age and my scholarly abilities are affected by it, but I try to put on a good show and that's the most I can do. Many, many thanks to all the participants. Now you have time if you want to. I prepared myself a drink. And if you want to. Let everyone some time to prepare. Once. OK, Lechaim. Lechaim, at Stream. L'chaim. Same to you. L'chaim. L'chaim. L'chaim.
Lechaim Marinus. Lechaim. Thank you. <laughs> and, and so in person. Lechaim. Lechaim David. Lechaim Michael. Lechaim Shabtai. Lechaim Shabtai. Lechaim Nurit. Uh, whom, whom, whom did I forget? Lechaim. My great friends, the nice. Lechaim Shabtai. Lechaim Shabtai. Lechaim to everybody. Lechaim Rivka and all those that I do not see, the, the participants, uh, Raz and... Lechaim uh, Shabtai. And, okay. Lechaim <laughs> <laughs> I, I what was that? This is thing of the I'm Gabriela. I'm Shabbat. Dinosaurs, the two of us. You know. Okay. Okay.